It's a happy Monday for the first time in a while for BYU football. And to help us celebrate that and Halloween, ESPN College Football Insider and Analyst, National Champion College Football Player Trevor Maddich on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Trevor, tomorrow is Halloween. To celebrate the BYU win, what are you dressing up as? I am dressing up as hope. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do it yet. I, it's it's kind of a concept instead of a thing, but at least there's hope. So I want to reflect that somehow. Oh, that's fantastic. I really would be interested to see what hope looks like. <laughs> it's been so long since we discussed a BYU win. What are your main takeaways from the Cougars win on Saturday against a bad San Jose State team, but a win nonetheless? Well, the first takeaway is not on the field. The first takeaway is just the feeling. To go on a losing streak like that is a long slog of misery. And as bad as it is for the fans, it's a lot worse for the players. Because you're out there working as hard as Alabama. They are. You're out there, you're out there hurting. Your body hurts as bad as Ohio State. It just, it just does. But instead of having validation, you're having criticism heaped upon you as being inept and largely lame. And whether or not that's fair, that's the reality. And to have this win, to be able to, to get some validation for your hard work for the first time in two months is an amazing feeling. And I'm so happy for the players that they were able to, to get that monkey off their back and just get this feeling for the first time since, well, the opener. The word aggressive permeated throughout the coaches and the players all week long throughout the program. This program is going to be aggressive in this game, and they absolutely were. Right out of the gate, they were aggressive. Why do you think we hadn't seen that before? Well, we have. It just hasn't worked. You throw the ball down the field, and it's either intercepted or almost intercepted or incomplete. And after a while, the play caller gets tired of calling plays on second and ten. And so you start to check it down and try to get a few yards so you can stay somewhat even with the chains. When you are aggressive and it works, now you can continue to be aggressive because now all of a sudden you stay even with the chains or ahead of the chains. Now you can get into a play-calling rhythm because you've got some first downs that you string together. And instead of three and out trying desperately to get 10 yards so that your defense doesn't have to run right back on the field, all of a sudden you run a series of plays, you get a first down, now you can run counters off of those plays. You get another first down. Now you can do a play action pass and bam, down the field. And all these things all snowball to positive effect when it works. When it doesn't work, it's not always just because they aren't trying to do the right things. It's that they're trying to do anything to get that first down and then that second first down. So they came out aggressive, yeah, but this time the aggression worked. The plays were completed. Things happened. The rhythm was established. And that was really more of a difference than just the idea that we're going to be more aggressive. Trevor Maddich of ESPN with us on BYU Sports Nation, another Maddich Monday. Trevor, what was your takeaway moment or highlight from Saturday's game for BYU? It was Braden Elbakri. And that fumble caused on the kickoff after their first touchdown. That was a tone setter for the entire game. The, the entire sideline erupted. He might have changed the season, right? I mean, that well, hit. Well, may have. Certainly, certainly it gave BYU a feeling that they haven't had all year. Because really the, the victory in the opener against Portland State wasn't, uh, didn't feel good because they weren't good. They played an FCS team that, that, uh, that had some good players, but really they should have blown out. And instead it was just an ugly feeling even though they got the win. This whole year they haven't had a good feeling. And so, yeah, this is, this is a it, – it's a it, – El Bakri made that hit. He recovered that fumble. The offense punched it in. Then they went up 14 to nothing before you can blink. I mean, when since, – since Portland State, really – when have they been? When does that happen? When have they played with the lead? It's, it's a different feeling. It's a different way to approach now your job as a football player, especially a defensive football player, because all of a sudden you've got the lead. Now you can be more aggressive. Now you can do things besides just hang on by your fingernails. Offensively, you've got the lead, so you can take more chances. Because if it doesn't work this time around, well, that's okay. It's not going to cost us the game if we don't go down and score this drive because we're already down three touchdowns. So this is the kind of thing that establishes a mindset 
even more than it establishes the points. The points are nice. The points are important, right? But it's the mindset that that kind of a play establishes on the sideline and then punching it into score to go up 14 to nothing establishes in terms of the game planning, the momentum, getting out of first gear. I mean, the, Risk, uh, the Redskins, the, the Cougars have not been out of first gear really all season long. They, they've been trying to get some traction all year long, especially offensively, and, and they got that with that one big, massive, tone-setting bell cow of a hit by Braden L. Bakri. Trevor, philosophically, what kind of impact, especially for a team that desperately needed it like we've talked about, what impact can – a single win have on a team? It can have an impact. Well, actually, it can have a huge impact in this situation because all of a sudden it also changes how you practice. It's so hard to go through the process. We hear that from Nick Saban all the time. Different teams call it different things. I mean, uh, Oregon used to call it win the day. I think Ole Miss still does. They, they play like a champion today like the, for Notre Dame. That that counts for practice, including, or excuse me, in addition to games. But if we look at Nick, Nick Saban calling it the process, what it means is that you don't win on Saturday. You win on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday because of all the little things that you do in the meeting room, the, the focus that you have on each drill, in each rep in each drill on the practice field, each rep in the weight room. All of those things during the week are what determine how you play on Saturday. And that is critical because it's so hard to be focused and excited and practicing like the season matters, practicing like this next game coming up is the biggest game of your life when you're in the middle of a seven-game losing streak. And so the part of the thing that this does is create that kind of atmosphere now for the week of practice going forward. That's the thing I'm, I'm also very excited about. I'm glad that the players have the feeling of the win on game day. But now I'm also glad that they have that kind of feeling going into the week of practice because now it gives them a little bit of downhill momentum to make it easier to maintain that focus during the week, whereas before it was trying to run uphill through mud. And now I think they've got a much better situation. Great stuff with ESPN's Trevor Maddich thus far. And you're absolutely right. Even after the Portland State win, it's not like BYU had that feeling of euphoria because of the way the game played out. This is a unique situation for this 2017 group of BYU Cougars now staring down a 5-3 and three Fresno State team who lost to an improved UNLV squad in Las Vegas. What do you think – or expect, I should say, of BYU against Fresno State on Saturday? Well, this will be a tough game for BYU. I think BYU fans need to understand that Fresno State's a good team. They, and they do some things exceptionally well. Their, their offense is in the top two or three of most statistical categories in the Mountain West. Their defense does a lot of things well. Uh, defensively, they're the best team in the conference at limiting first downs on third down third down conversion. So they get you off the field on third down better than any other team in the Mountain West. So this is a tough team, and I don't want to put rain on the parade, but ESPN's Football Power Index, FPI, gives BYU an 18% chance of winning this game, 18%. So this is a game that if BYU plays well and wins, needs to be seen as a terrific victory. Not like a win over a, a, a San Jose State team that, that really can't do anything well but over a team that's actually doing a lot of things well that has a winning record, and that, that FPI, which is a dispassionate series of, of metrics that decide who has the best chance to win, thinks that Fresno State is overwhelmingly going to win. So BYU, that doesn't mean they can't win it, but that means as BYU fans look at this game, look at it as, as a very tough obstacle, and if the Cougars are able to play well and win, they should get tremendous praise for it. Trevor, the game that uh, college football fans are talking about from the weekend is Penn State and Ohio State. How in the world did the Nittany Lions lose that game? Well, they lost it because JT Barrett had an all-timer of a second half, especially an all-timer of a fourth quarter. Yeah. At one point, he, he completed 16 straight passes. And I did a breakdown on SportsCenter Saturday morning uh, before all the games happened about JT Barrett and how he was doing. And he's been on fire over the last four weeks or so mostly in the, in, the, in the running game and in the short and intermediate passing game. Uh, 
But even though he's completed a lot of passes down the field during that stretch, it was, I guess, lesser competition, and the balls weren't really all that accurate. Against better defenses, those balls needed to be more accurate, or what were touchdowns, against teams like Army and UNLV and Nebraska last week, those would be interceptions at the goal line against teams like Penn State if the ball wasn't more accurate. So what does he do? He comes out and throws that ball down the field with pinpoint accuracy and leads them to one of the epic comebacks that that we'll see all season. That's a, a phenomenal thing for Ohio State because it's what they need. Keep in mind that Last year, they were shut out 31 nothing in the playoff game against Clemson, largely because they couldn't throw the ball down the field. So Clemson's defense was able to come up and crowd the line of scrimmage. And when the short running game and the short passing game was jammed, they didn't have an answer because they couldn't complete it down the field. Well, now against Penn State, boy, did they. The question now is, will they be able to keep it up, or was that a one-time thing? I think they'll be able to keep it up. But if they do keep it up, if J.T. Barrett can throw down the field like he did on Saturday, this is a team that will threaten to win the national championship. After this weekend's shakeup, what does your top four in college football look like now? Right now it's Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, and at number four I've got Notre Dame. Ooh, Yeah, Notre Dame. And Notre Dame is a team that's a real threat. This summer, when I did my college football tour, drive around the country, 14,000 miles this summer, it was kind of crazy. I did a video on campus at Notre Dame and posted it on social media, I think, in August. And I said that that this is a Notre Dame team that, while they went 4-8 and last year, can be in the playoff this year, and I talked about why. And I'll tell you what, all the things that I had hoped, or most of them, have occurred in favor of Notre Dame. And this is a team that is averaging over 300 yards rushing a game, no matter which defense it's against. I mean, NC State has a lot of NFL guys on their defensive front seven, and Notre Dame blasted them for over 300 yards rushing. So this is a team that's also a real threat to make national noise. Now keep this in mind. If Notre Dame wins out, and that'll be tough because they still have a really tough schedule to go. But if they do win out, then if they make the playoff at 11-1, and one, there will be at least two Power Five conferences that are not in the playoff. Hmm. And look at this. Georgia and Alabama are both dominating, and they're both undefeated. What if they get to the SEC championship game? And let's say that Georgia beats Alabama by a late field goal in the SEC championship game. Both of those teams might be in. Then if Notre Dame is also in, then you'll have three Power Five conferences that are out. So Notre Dame could really put a thumb in the eye of the Power Five conference champions if they are able to make the playoff because they will knock somebody out. Yeah, let's go independence. That's right. Trevor, great stuff. The face, perhaps the literal face, of hope on Halloween. (laughs) ESPN's Trevor Maddich. Thank you.